it's in Luke's Gospel, in the second half of Luke chapter 24, to which perhaps you would now like to turn in your Bible. There is certainly no more beautiful story in the Gospels than this account of Jesus meeting with and ministry to these two unknown but obviously depressed and discouraged disciples on the road to Emmaus. There are so many ways in which we can learn from this incident that is, I suppose, very familiar to the vast majority of us. But I want this evening to focus on it in a particular way. Because it has seemed to me as I've been meditating on this chapter that there is nowhere where our Lord appears more clearly underlining the centrality of certain vital areas of truth as he does in his dealings with these two men. And it is in that way that I want us to approach this incident this evening. And I want us to see our Lord Jesus Christ here affirming four central areas of Christian truth as he deals with these discouraged disciples. And there are four centralities Let me point them out to you first of all before we turn to them one by one. First of all, the centrality of Scripture for true Christian service. One of the fundamental things to which this incident points us and for which I'm sure it is here in the record of the Gospels. Secondly, the centrality of Christ for true Christian salvation. Thirdly, the centrality of the cross for the true Christian gospel. And finally, the centrality of faith for true Christian experience. These are the four areas in which I want us particularly to focus this evening as we turn to this familiar incident. And first of all, the centrality of Scripture for true Christian service because as these two men make their way to Emmaus from Jerusalem on the weekend of the crucifixion and resurrection they have been experiencing various emotions they are saddened by a peculiar sorrow as verse 17 tells us they stood still looking sad they are disappointed in their hopes verse 21 we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. They are bewildered in their minds and unable to see any pattern or sense in the circumstances through which they have recently come and in which they have been deeply involved. And as Jesus draws alongside them and walks with them, he comes first as the servant par excellence as the minister of God to the souls of these men, to deal with them in their perplexity, to meet them at this point of particular need, and to minister to their weakness. And so there is a special sense in which this incident on the road to Emmaus is a classic picture of our Lord Jesus engaged in his role as the servant of God ministering to the needs of these men. And he thereby becomes a picture and parable for us of all true Christian service. And as he sets about ministering to them, what I want to draw your attention to at this point is how he becomes their servant and God's servant by becoming the servant of the Word of God. Now that is the great characteristic that Jesus illustrates before us here in this remarkable incident that he has become in order to serve them the servant of the Word of God. Spurgeon puts it typically in this way. He who was the author and theme of Holy Scripture now becomes its expositor and teacher. And the implement which Jesus used 
and in which he placed his confidence as he dealt with these men was Holy Scripture. And whether their needs were theological and doctrinal or emotional and psychological or personal and intellectual, Jesus brings to bear upon these men's lives the power of the Word of God. Now that's what becomes so obvious, do you notice, as he begins to speak to them. He said to them in verse 25, O foolish men and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken, was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So how is Jesus ministering to these men? How does he deal with them at their deepest problems? He ministers to them out of Holy Scripture. Nor is this an isolated occasion in Jesus' ministry. A few verses later on, do you notice, when he moves away from this scene to the upper room where the disciples are assembled, in verse 44 he said to them, These are my words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures and said to them, Thus it is written. What then is the cardinal trademark of our Lord Jesus' ministry to the hearts and minds and spirits of men in this kind of need? What is it that he takes up and uses? It is God's written word. And there is here an evidence given to us by our Lord Jesus of the centrality of Holy Scripture in Christian service. And I say to you, he thereby sets a pattern for all who would be servants of God. If this is where our Lord Jesus places his confidence, how dare we place our confidence anywhere else? If this is the instrument that our Lord Jesus used by which to minister to the needs of men and women, how dare we take up any other instrument? If this is where men's minds were clarified and their hearts inspired and their lives transformed under Jesus' ministry, may we not equally conclude that it is precisely in this way that these needs will be met under every ministry which arises from his. How do you notice how Jesus illustrates the various, various areas where Paul tells us Scripture is profitable? Do you remember in that classic passage in 2 Timothy 3.16, where he says all scripture is profitable, inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. Now here is the Lord Jesus as the teacher. He is teaching these men in their confusion the truth as it is in Holy Scripture. They are bewildered. They are confused about what has been happening. They do not understand the purpose of God. Where does the Lord Jesus take them to? He takes them to the supreme authority of Holy Scripture. When he finds that they have been suffering from slowness of heart and unbelief, it is through the Scripture that he reproves them. When their lives need resetting in its direction, which is what correction means, it is through Holy Scripture that he does it. When they need training in righteousness, a new zeal which would set aflame their souls for God, it is through Holy Scripture that Jesus ministers to them. Now there are a few things that we need to learn more in these days than what our Lord here gives us illustration and pattern of. 
and that is the centrality of Holy Scripture in true Christian service. This is where unbelief is turned to faith. This is where despair is turned to hope and error to truth and confusion to order. And above all, it is here that men find Christ because that is what was happening on the Emmaus Road. Now I say to you this evening that this is something that we need to learn and I am not just thinking about those who despise Holy Scripture or who would doubt its veracity or who would not subscribe to our doctrine of Holy Scripture. I am thinking about the evangelical church in our land today. I am thinking about ourselves, my Christian brothers and sisters. We need a fresh baptism of confidence in Holy Scripture as God's appointed implement in our service of Him. And supremely, as I say, because it is here that we find Christ, the living Word is found in the written Word. And I think that may be an explanation for the urgency with which Jesus presses the scriptures upon these men who have had their eyes closed to who he is and what he has been doing. And he recognizes that the place where their eyes will be opened is in Holy Scripture. So that if we discover ourselves with our confidence in Scripture eroded, if we find ourselves being drawn away to have our confidence in some other area than Scripture, then we are inevitably being drawn away from the pattern that the Lord Jesus has provided for us in his ministry, the centrality of Scripture for true Christian service. You notice the second thing to which this incident points us is the centrality of Christ for true Christian salvation. What I'm calling your attention to now is the central theme of Scripture as Jesus identified it. He had done so again and again, of course, during his earthly ministry before his death. The Scriptures, he said, are they that bear witness to me. And again and again he quotes scripture and says, It is written of me, it must be fulfilled of me. And Jesus clearly saw the central theme of scripture as being himself. And here on the Emmaus Road and in the upper room, it is clear that this is his central theme. Beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. And you get an amplification of this in verse 44, when in the upper room he says, These are my words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Now you will notice that this is to Jesus the central theme of Holy Scripture. It was to him that the law pointed, for example, as the one who alone would be able to fulfill it in perfect righteousness. It was to him that the law pointed as the one who could alone bear its curse in his perfect sacrifice. It was to him the prophets pointed when they wrote of a coming suffering Savior who would bear our iniquities and carry our sorrows. It was of him that the psalmist sang as they spoke of him desolate and forsaken. Again and again in the psalms, Jesus sees himself there. And he is presenting himself here to these Emmaus Road disciples as the key theme in Holy Scripture. The whole chorus of Scripture points to Christ. And the reason, of course, is that all our needs are met 
in him. This, in a sense, is the point of Scripture. It is so to point us to Jesus that we may find in the written word the living word and discover in him that all our needs are met in him. That he is our wisdom, he is our righteousness, he is our sanctification, he is our redemption, he is our hope and joy and peace. And it is for this reason that Scripture is given to us, not merely to lead us into theological doctrinal truth, but to lead us to Jesus. May I ask you this this evening, my dear friend, is this what Scripture has done for you? It is possible, you see, for us, to misuse Scripture and think wrongly about it in the sense that we may find ourselves reading Scripture but never really seeking Christ in Scripture. And every day of your life as a child of God, this is what you should be doing. The very essence of coming to the Scripture is that it is Christ you will meet here. Now that is how Jesus became an expositor of Scripture. What he taught them was to look for himself here. He opened the Scriptures and in Moses and the Psalms and the prophets, he showed them himself. And this is where Christ is to be found. Now, wherever your Emmaus road may be, I want to say to you this evening that however you may identify with these men in their particular need, the ultimate central need of your life is for a personal encounter with this same Jesus. I am not now therefore asking you if you have had association with Christian people or belong to the Christian church. I am not asking you if you are recognized as being a Christian by other people or use that name for yourself. I am asking you, have you had a personal, radical encounter with the living Christ? I'll tell you where you will meet him. You will meet him in Holy Scripture. Because he is its central theme, and the scripture is the medium God employs to bring us to Christ. I have seen that happen in so many ways over the years. There was a man I knew in New Mills whose life was in great, great brokenness and need. And he had had absolutely no kind of knowledge of Christianity or the Christian faith or anything to do with it. And one day as he was getting on a bus to go into Kilmarnock, having spoken with his sister who had become a Christian some time ago in a man manner that doesn't matter, she handed him a Bible and said to him, read that. Now that totally godless man went away and began to read. And one day he came back home to his wife and said to her, something has happened to me. And I don't know what it is, he said, but I'm greatly disturbed. The very machinery in the factory, he said, is pounding something in my mind which I believe is a, something God is saying to me and I don't know what it's all about. But he began to seek and to search. And his wife said to him, there's a group of Christians up there, you ought to go and speak with them. And ultimately he did. And as he began to unfold his story to them, they said to him, what has happened to you is that you have found Christ, or he has found you. And that man became a 
powerful living witness for Jesus Christ in his community. I say to you this evening, my dear friend, it is not religion that you need. It is not church that you need. It is not reformation of life that you need. It is Christ that you need. For true salvation is found in him, not in a theory about him, but in him as a person. And I see the great danger in these days of many people stopping short of real living encounter with Jesus. I spoke some months ago to a student in Glasgow University who said to me that he had begun to associate with Christian people, had known all the truth and known all the arguments for Christianity. But he said to me, I don't think I've ever really myself come to know Christ. And I said to him, well, you take John's gospel. And if you promise me that because you are eager and earnest about seeking God, you will go away and read it, I can tell you God has promised that those who truly seek him will surely find him. And this is where you will find him. Within 48 hours, he had telephoned one of his lecturers one morning and said to him, I have met with Christ. And so he had. And what I want to ask you this evening is, have you really met with Jesus? Because it is in Jesus that salvation in all its fullness is to be found. That's the second great centrality, and here is the third. If Holy Scripture is central for true Christian service in this example of our Lord, and if Christ is central for true Christian salvation, then Jesus also speaks to us here of the centrality of the cross for a true Christian gospel. It was, of course, the cross which was the great stumbling block, you see, to these two men. Why are you sad, says Jesus? Well, they were sad because Jesus of Nazareth had been condemned and crucified, as they said. And they were sad because they had hoped that in some sense he would become a king and savior and messiah to them. And they had great high hopes for Jesus coming into the situation in which they found themselves in an occupied country, that he might become a new king for them and lead his people in a new exodus out into victory. And what they did not know was that that suffering and death which had become their stumbling block was really the ground of their hope. Someone has written precisely the thing which these two had allowed to destroy their hope was to be the ground of it. So as Jesus taught them out of the scripture concerning himself, you will notice that his theme is not only Christ and Christ central for Christian salvation, it was Christ crucified. In verse 26 we read, Was it not necessary? He brings the argument to them, was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter his glory? And again in verse 46, he says, Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the grave. Now it is that that is the kernel of a true gospel. It is this that made it possible for Jesus to say in verse 47 that they were to go out and preach repentance and forgiveness of sins in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem because the gospel is constituted by the good news of Christ's death, 
in the place of sinners bearing our judgment in his own body on the tree. That's the core of the Christian gospel. And it's the centrality of this that Jesus insists upon with these men. This has become a stumbling block to them, you see. Jesus says this is the very essence of the gospel. It is on this that you have to rest your hope. It is here that the gospel finds its very center. Was it not necessary? Well, of course it was necessary. It was necessary because of human sin and failure. It was necessary because of divine holiness and his wrath against sin. It was necessary because of God's judgment and justice. And it was necessary because of his astonishing love and mercy towards sinners. It was out of this necessity that the death of Jesus came as the hope for sinful men. And the centrality of the cross Jesus insists upon as the very ground of the gospel. And so it is for us. It is the suffering and dying of the Lord Jesus in a quite specific sense that he takes our place on the cross and suffers our sin's judgment and bears the penalty of it and dies our death in our place. It is that that constitutes the gospel. So let me say to you this evening that we are not at liberty to talk about alternative theories of the atonement or different views of the death of Christ. The gospel depends on the biblical view of Jesus dying in the place of sinners. And as Jesus sees these two men, he will not let them go until he has expounded to them out of Scripture the meaning of his death. And we need to recognize the centrality of that for the sake of the gospel that we bring to men in our generation. Do you notice how these centralities are so cardinal in our current Christian situation? The centrality of Scripture, the centrality of Christ and Christ alone as the one in whom salvation is found, the centrality of the cross as God's appointed way for sinners to be saved. These are the great centralities. And I say to you, it's a very significant thing that in so many different ways it's there that erosion is beginning to take place in many areas of the evangelical world. So we need to be set not only for the proclamation but for the defense of the gospel in its God-given purity. The centrality of Scripture for true Christian service and the centrality of Christ for true Christian salvation and the centrality of the cross for true Christian gospel. And finally, will you notice with me the centrality of faith for true Christian experience? You will notice that Jesus diagnoses this as the real problem that these men have. Their spirits are cast down and their hearts are heavy. Their eyes are clouded and their minds are bewildered because they are slow or sluggish of heart to believe. And Jesus, having listened to them, to all that they are saying about the events of that day and their problem about that, we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and beside all this, now is the third day since this happened. Some of the women of our company amazed us. They were at the tomb and it was empty, but they did not see him. And Jesus says, O oh, foolish men, and slow of heart, to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Now you see what he is saying. 
their apprehension of Christ is clouded. Their enjoyment of his presence is impossible for the simple reason that they did not believe the Bible. Have you grasped this? Jesus' diagnosis is quite specific. The reason their minds were clouded, the reason their understanding was befogged, the reason their spirits were cast down, the reason Jesus was not real to them on the road to Emmaus was that they, they did not believe the Bible. Now I want to say to you this evening, that that is universally applicable. And there is a call here, therefore, to the centrality of faith for true Christian experience, and quite specifically to faith in Holy Scripture, because faith in Scripture and the enjoyment of Christ in Christian experience cannot be divorced. The reality of the presence of Jesus in all its beauty cannot be divorced from Holy Scripture and our absolute confidence in it. I don't know Billy Graham very well, but I spoke with him for some time at the Urbana Students' Conference in the United States two or three years ago. And he said to a few of us, when we were talking about the crisis of confidence in Scripture in certain areas of America, Billy Graham said, my great concern is not only theological and doctrinal, although it is that, but for me, he said, when I burned my boats behind me, as it were, and when I trusted with utter confidence in Holy Scripture, the glory and presence of the Lord Jesus became a new reality to me. And I think it is an important thing for us to grasp that faith in Holy Scripture and the enjoyment of Christ in Christian experience cannot be divorced the one from the other. Their heart burned within them when did their heart burn within them? When did they know this experience of the burning heart? A sense of great joy and inward glory at the presence of Christ. It was when he expounded to them the scripture and talked with them by the way. I say to you, my dear friends, this is where the reality of Jesus comes to us in a supreme sense. It is not therefore merely an academic matter, although there are many academic questions to be raised and thought through in terms of Holy Scripture. And I think it is vital that thinking people should do that. But I want to say to you, it touches on this whole area of our fellowship with and enjoyment of the Lord Jesus Christ in a personal sense. And faith is quite central for true Christian experience. So there are these great centralities to which this occasion points us. And as we travel ourselves along the highway of our own life, it is so often true that Jesus comes out of the shadows as he came to these men towards the evening and begins to take us to Holy Scripture that we might discover these centralities for the sake of our service for the sake of our salvation, for the sake of our understanding of the gospel, for the sake of our fellowship with Christ. And I say to you, the fundamental thing of all is that we might cast our confidence utterly where Jesus placed his in Holy Scripture.
and in his great grace God may give to us hearts which will likewise burn and eyes which will likewise be opened. Let us pray together. Our gracious God, we bow ourselves before you and thank you that the same risen Savior is here amongst us this evening. We bless you for his confident trust in Scripture, for his ministry of your word, for his interpretation of its truth. And we pray that we may bow at his feet and learn afresh from him this evening. Deliver us, Lord, from seeking in our proud self-will to have our confidence anywhere else than in your written word. And grant that as we go forth this evening, in your great mercy, the same risen Savior may come to us and open our eyes and reveal himself to us in all his glory. We ask it for his name's sake. Amen.